Uh -oh. well, welcome to Christian Virtual Fellowship, the online church ministry of Allegiance to the King. And uh, tonight, Jackson and I are, are hosting a Wednesday night fellowship. And tonight we're doing what we call a discussion fellowship, where we, we don't really have a teaching per se, but rather we, we open with a topic and uh, maybe with a, a brief explanation of the topic. And I'm kind that sun is right in my yeah. eyes. <laughs> and, uh, so, um, and he's going to try and do something. We shall see if that works. Yeah, we rack block. yeah if you move that, yeah. That work? <laughs> that work. There we go. Oh, not quite. Not quite. Not quite. No, no, no. You got to go that other way. way. Other way. Right. A little bit further. A little bit Now that's good. Right Right there. Okay. Yeah, that worked. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing spots. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, so anyway, the, I, you know what, this is one of the reasons we don't, I don't know if you, if you've noticed this, if you're watching it, we don't actually edit these videos and, unless there's some big problem or something, we have a big technical problem or something like that. And then it'll be minimal editing. And the reason that we don't edit these videos is because we just want them to be just like they were when we were here live. We want it to, to have the same feel as if you were here with us and not have any sort of, of like, you know, fancy editing or you know that kind of thing it um our our real goal here is to have fellowship together and and we're super blessed to have people that that want to to watch but we want to really encourage you to join us it, again if you're an isolated biblical unitarian you don't have a, a a church home that you can really be who who you are then come be with us and um and we'd love to have your fellowship with us so Again, tonight we're doing a discussion fellowship where we introduce a topic and then we we discuss that topic. And uh, normally we don't we don't usually record these, but I thought tonight the particular topic is an important one that um, I, that I felt like would be really good to to record and then maybe even get some online discussion going in uh, in the groups and. Uh, that where we put these videos. Okay, so what I want us to talk about tonight is maturing in Christ, and specifically the the idea that we're all all Christians are supposed to become mature in Christ. And so uh, let me I'm going to read a few verses. I'll talk briefly about each one of these, and then yes. have a comment or two, and then we'll. We'll open up for discussion. Jackson's going to lead that discussion. Okay, so the first verse we're going to go to is Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19. Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, if you want to turn your Bible there. And I'm not even, I'm not really even going to introduce the context because I don't I, I, it's not really important to what uh, I want to say about this verse. Galatians 4, 19, Paul says, My children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. And so, you know, we got to think about a couple of things about this. That one, Galatians, the, the people he's writing to were some of the initial people that he, on his first missionary journey, that he converted to Christ. He spent a little bit of time with them, not a long time, probably a few months. Um, and, and so it, um, he, he is saying here that he is again in labor with them until Christ is formed in them. And so two things about that. One is clearly, um, uh, the the Galatian believers had um, veered away from maturity in Christ, and um, we won't go into tonight what those issues were. But um, but the second piece is this idea that that Paul's goal here with the 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 saints that he was dealing with was to form Christ in them, right? And that he's surprised that he's going to have to do this again. 
with mm -hmm. these believers. He's he's I, I would even say maybe even a little frustrated um, in the book of Galatians. All right, turn to Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four, and we'll start in verse one. What we're going to do is we're going to read verses one through three, and then I'm going to skip down to verse 11, and we'll read verses 11 through 15. So Ephesians chapter four, verse one says, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So I, I, I see that as a calling them, urging them to be mature in Christ, right? And verse two, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And then skipping down to verse 11, and he, Jesus, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ. So again, we see here the purpose of these gift ministries is to help us to mature in Christ. But more importantly, there is an expectation that that is going to occur. Mm -hmm. Turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. And while you're turning there, so there in Ephesians, we can see that there's a there's a standard, there's a purpose that is supposed to be occurring. That that every Christian is supposed to mature in Christ. And I want to argue, based upon what we saw in Galatians and then there in Ephesians, that that's not supposed to take a lifetime, mm -hmm. right? And we're going to see this again here in Ephesians 5, in, chap or in chapter 5, verse 11, and we're going to read verses 11 through 14, concerning him, we have much to say, and it is difficult to explain. He's been comparing uh uh, Jesus to Melchizedek. Um, we have much to say in it, and it is difficult to explain since you have become poor listeners. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the actual words of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unacquainted with the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to distinguish between good and evil. And uh, I want to point out that, uh, you know, especially for if you're watching this video later, if you're not familiar with this idiom, uh, distinguishing or discerning uh, good and evil, it, it's a, a, a Hebrew idiom for the 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 proper right and, and and authority as well of judging judging um in various situations showing good judgment and being able to do that well and also having the authority to do that in other words we are supposed to get to the place in maturity where not only can we teach the the gospel and the rest of the scriptures even if you're not called as a uh, uh, an ordained teacher, that you still should be mature enough to be able to do all that, and that you're also supposed to be mature enough that you can actually judge things well, that people can come to you and look to you 
for good judgment about things that they they need help with and determining right from wrong and good from bad and what you should do or not do and and those kinds of things and yet he's uh, the writer of hebrews is taking them to task because they ought to have been at that place and yet they're still like infants and so what i want to say is my experience over the many years of being a christian uh, being in various churches in different settings and even in different denominations and um and and seeing a a, a, a lot the sort of the whole gamut working in in ministry for for many many years now is that my experience is that most christians are infants and in some cases they may have knowledge they may have a lot of knowledge but they're still infants that they haven't actually matured in christ and and I, i'm not going to get into it um, now, but when Jackson and I were talking about this, this subject, he brought up first Corinthians 12 and the idea that we're all supposed to be contributing to the body of Christ, that we all have callings within the body and we're supposed, and the body is supposed to work together, everything working properly together where we're all contributing <laughs> in the work of ministry. Right. And the problem is there's a whole lot of babies and and, and here's the real problem. It wouldn't be a problem if there were a lot of babies, if they were at the stage in their Christian life where they're supposed to be babies, right? Mm -hmm. Where they're new babes in Christ and they're supposed to get milk and start to learn and grow and things like that. The problem is we have way too many people in the church. And I'm not just, I'm not just talking about our, you know, A2K or, you know, Christian virtual fellowship. I'm talking about all of Christianity, at least the Christianity that I'm I'm used to in the West, I don't I'm, I I can't speak for maybe other parts of the world, but that the church is filled with babies who've been babies for decades, and yet we can see here that the expectation is that that is not how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be that pretty quickly in their walk. Let's call it with certainly within the first five years. I I would actually argue that it really should be in the first year or two that a person should become pretty mature in Christ in that in that period, and and yet that's not that's not what we see happen. Now, uh, I am I'm a big believer in uh, the ideas in Jocko Willink's Extreme Ownership, uh, his book and and his uh, podcast and and stuff like that. And what, what he's going to say is anytime you have a situation like that, the, the fault lies at the feet of the leaders. And, uh, and, and so, and I, I agree wholeheartedly with that, that the, the, the church in general, uh, uh, the leadership of the church has, has not done a, its job of helping people to mature in Christ. And for a lot of churches, that's not even the goal. Yeah. Uh, it, the goal is just simply to get people into pews in a lot of churches right. and, and to, to, to get them to make a, um, you know, yeah. to say a statement of faith in Christ, right. And make that mental ascent and come to church regularly. Okay. They, they might want them to volunteer. stop sin sinning and they might want them to volunteer for some things. They certainly want them to pay their, their tithes and offerings. Um, but maturing in Christ so that they're actual full, they, they're able to teach, you know, unless the person has uh, a lot of drive on their own to, to want to do that, they're not likely to do that. They're mm -hmm. likely to continue to show up week after week and sit in the pews and listen to the nice sermon and then go home and be very immature. And, yeah. and, and so, but even I, I would, I would argue too, that even if you have more effort than that in your church to help people mature in Christ, there's still the responsibility of each and every one of us to participate in that process. And so even when you have good leadership that is trying to help people to mature in Christ, you have an awful lot of people who perhaps because of the way our society works or, you know, um, 
the way our our culture, um, you know, and and sort of Western culture, which I would include Australia in that, um, that it's a, uh, you know, it's just people have this sort of expectation of, uh, what's the right term? the an expectation of compartmentalization and specialization that well all that's the job of the pastoral staff right you know that that sort of thing and and i you know we see that is not the way it's supposed to be the the leaders in the church are not supposed to be all doing the work of ministry. The church is supposed to be doing the work of ministry. The church is supposed to be evangelizing. The church is supposed to be teaching. The church is supposed to be raising up new believers, right? The the those apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they're there, they're there to train the church to do that stuff. And and they they do it by leading, by example, and stuff like that. So so they're certainly doing those things. But it's not supposed to be on solely on their shoulders. And so the combination of the two, one, the leaders not having the right model in the first place of actually doing that, that they're not the one who's supposed to get up every week and do a teaching. They're supposed to be teaching others to be doing teachings and having a whole bunch of people in the church that are capable of that and that are doing that not only within the body of Christ, but outside of the body of Christ as well. All right, so I want to wrap up my my introduction there with, uh, you know, a with just a, a question for us in discussion, which is, what you know, what what do you guys see in that that's with that stuff that that I just talked about? What's your experience as well as what do you think keeps us uh, in the church from from really fulfilling this calling of every believer? maturing in Christ and it not taking years and years and years and decades and decades and a whole lifetime sometimes. And maybe that, you know, a lot of people never actually maturing in Christ. So I'll turn it over to you. And get us out of the, the face light again. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's move. Do you need to move it? Um, I, I think, don't, I think it's not okay. Gonna be able to do yeah. It, it's going to change so fast yeah. now. It won't matter. Um, yeah, I'm very curious what your guys' thoughts are on that sort of stuff. Cause, uh, I have my own ideas about, um, some of the, the social aspects that have become kind of the norm in the average church that, uh, basically foster shallow, shallowness, shallow relationships, and in my mind, that's part of the issue, but I'm curious what you guys think. Does anybody have a, wow. any thoughts they want to volunteer, Donna? Yeah, I, you know, I, I feel you and I don't want to cry. You know, I felt a conviction in the last couple of days and I had a few women come to me and ask me to, um, you know, to really go deeper to prophesy for them. And I had a conversation with Julie, um, Julia, and I um, really felt very convicted. Um, and she said, you know, Donna, the reason I asked is because I believe that there are a few people that are seen that can prophesy. She said, do you know how many people will not uh, even lean into the power of God? They don't want to. And so she said, my hope was, you know, I know you do, and I know there's a few others in A2K, so you know, I'm searching for someone to meet my need that can, that I see people using the power of God that I believe in. But there's so many people, so many Christians that they do nothing of the sort. Jackson, I was reeling from this conversation last night. She wasn't trying to pin me down, but boy, you know, I honored it. And I had a big conversation using, um, you know, my not only my intellect, but my heart. And I said, Juliet, I promise you that I will be in a better headspace for you and I will continue to pray for you uh, and do exactly that. And if the Lord shows me anything, you know, I will bring it to you. You don't even have to request it anymore. And then Laura, you know, and my conviction was, 
um, not that I can't, but, you know, I just figured, you know, no, oh, it's time for other people to rise up, Father. I'm just assuming, you know, that they have that heart to rise up. So I'm kind of back, you know, I'm kind of thinking, I'm assuming everybody's going to do this. And my assumption is totally wrong. So last night I said, Lord, what should I do? And he said, I want you to read this book again, totally committed, because I'm going to show you some stuff in here. And if you're not totally committed, 150% from the get-go, from the hour you say, Jesus, come into my life, you ain't getting nowhere with me. I don't care how much you know. I don't care how educated you are. If your heart is not 100% committed, you'll never grow. And as I was reading this, even in chapter one, I knew God was talking to me. Commitment never ceases to be shallow. It's excited about doing the will of God. And it's not always based on the finite knowledge that comes into play, but it's passionate. It can't wait. Look at it, Gardo. Can't wait to get to the next place. Can't is up in the morning, doesn't care, heart flopping all around. Can't wait to work for the Lord. Is eager to jump up and say, What do you want me to do next, Lord? What can I do for you today? What can I do for my brothers and sisters? Can't wait. That's the passion. And you can't wait around to be till you have you either have it or you don't. And um, falling into boredom, falling into um, entertaining yourself to death, you know, because you're bored. And I think this concept of, you know, brick and mortar church. So I know some of the key elements. One is passion. And you can flame into, you know, I, I thought of the scripture. I've been working the scripture, um, you know, Timothy, you know, was severely warned by Paul. He, he was exhorted, put into practice that gift of Holy Spirit, you know, flame into, you know, flame yourself up, get yourself going. You do it. God's not going to do it for you. He already gifted you. You do it out of total commitment and adoration for your father, for the things he's already done for you. And it's a, it's a, it's a servant heart. And if you're not going to be there, you're not going to grow. You're not going to grow just by not. I have a lot of knowledge. That doesn't mean I have character. That doesn't mean I'm going to grow. And I think America is so, you know, we <laughs> talking to somebody, talking to a sister yeah, at, two days ago, trying to talk her into servanthood, trying to talk her out of self-centeredness. And I said, you know, this conversation is useless and you're tiring. Yeah, I'm getting tired just talking to you. I'm, I can't pull it out of you. You know, if you want to be the long ranger and that's where you want to go, I don't recommend it. And I'm not going to agree with you. But you know what? We have we have no time. We're, we're making so many excuses. Why does it take a lifetime for us to grow up? What is wrong with us? You know what's wrong? We're just we've got too much going on here. Too much materialism, too much comfort, none of the persecution. I'm not wrong. And I shared with her, I said, you know, persecuted Christians are more passionate than Christians in the United States. I judge myself also. And I told her that I said, I'm judging myself. I would rather judge myself right now and get it together for how many years I got left and get it together and be passionate about whatever I'm supposed to be doing to help somebody else to grow than sit here in denial, you know, and blame God and everybody else around me for why I'm not going to grow or blame my childhood or stay stuck in my past. And um, I don't recommend it. I also don't recommend a full diet of um, pop psychology. It sort of strips you. I recommend biblically based, just like he said, biblically based teachings. Biblically based, not pop psychology, not this um, babysitting Christians. And I myself have been guilty. You know, I myself have been guilty, but I have been very convicted since last night. So I'm honestly reviewing this book, revisiting commitment, revisiting my laziness and passion, because life begins in me. It doesn't begin with telling everybody. It begins in me, straightening myself out to be an example. I spent a lot of time with Edgardo last night and Juliet and just talking and getting excited and being supportive of Edgardo letting him share and praying for him. And it was such a beautiful, look at that man. He's up there, um, heart condition and everything, you know, trust in the Lord. And he's like a ball of fire 
in gangland where there's dangers and I'm seeing angels around him and Beatrice. And I told him too, I saw the angels around him and I told him so what I saw to give him courage. He, you know, he blessed me. I was excited for him, but also this is what he does for others. This is what others see in him. He's doing that. He's making that mark. He's doing the will of God, you know, just like Eric Chang did. And, you know, yeah, I want to get better at maturity. You know, I've spent far too 40 years and you're still groveling. There's something wrong with you. And it's commitment. It's commitment. That's yeah. just what I want to share for, out of my own passion. What's going on for me right now. Yeah, very cool. It is. Yeah. Nice. Commitment. Nice. Super Go ahead, Peter. Yeah. Uh, that was good, Donna. Um, the scripture that keeps coming to me is Matthew 14, 22 to 33, where Jesus is uh, walking on the water in the storm with the disciples. And, he, mm -hmm. you know, uh, he calls them to come out of the boat. <laughs> that can be us. Um, you know, we drag our feet. We wait on others to do. But we, what maybe the Lord is calling us to do, we think, oh, no, I, I'm not equipped to do that. Well, Part of equipping is making mistakes and having the courage to make mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and fear. Yeah, fear is a big thing, that a contributor that holds us back. We have fear of, I guess, making mistakes in front of others, fear of getting it wrong. Um, it holds us back. Um, and we, we saw Jesus with the disciples the whole time. They were making mistakes. Um <laughs> Why wouldn't we make mistakes too in maturing yeah. um, and hopefully making less mistakes over time? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's fascinating because um, I really love how John highlighted the analogy of an infant and in the concept of maturity, because there's so much you can pull from that, right? Like just, just this afternoon, I was playing in the pool with, with Zoe and Nigel and Nigel's very, you know, Zoe's had swim lessons for many, many months. And so she's pretty comfortable in the water and she can paddle around in the shallow end where she, her feet can touch if she goes down, that sort of stuff. But Nigel, he's totally new. So he had just got a life jacket now and he's getting, un he's uncomfortable being in the water by himself, you know, as he should be. But, but even with you there, he wants you to hold him a certain way because he's not comfortable with all the different ways he could be in the water. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and it, and it was a training period where it was like, you know, get him comfortable with this, get him comfortable with that, get him comfortable with this. And nobody's expecting two and a half year old Nigel to be like, I know what I'm doing. Let me at it. You know what I mean? Like you expect mm -hmm. there to be a struggle. You expect there to be imperfection. You expect there to be like this learning and feeling it out phase. And um, I totally feel what you're saying, Peter, where it's like a lot of the staying on the boat is the feeling like once you kind of hit physical adulthood and you feel like you should have it all together, you don't want to risk doing something that reveals your infancy in that area of what you could be physically doing. Right. And yeah. um, and. The other aspect that comes to my mind that I thought is really interesting about this is again with this infant um, analogy and one of the things John shared, like, you know, this inference that, you know, maybe one or two years to get into some major maturity in your life. Uh, <laughs> I'll try to make it quick, Edgar, so you can say what you want to share. Um, but in my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, so spiritual maturity is to be able to take the problems in life and deal with them the way Christ would have dealt with them, right? Like what would Jesus do kind of thing? And when you're an infant, you, uh, you poop in your pants, right? And when you're grown up, you don't. And one of the things as a, you know, a parent of young children, one of the things me and Hannah, our goal was, to get them potty trained like before they were two years old because it just makes everything easier <laughs> and i'm just thinking of god and it's like you know when you think about god and his goal with us does he want us pooping in our pants 
lifestyle wise, like, you know, when, when a difficulty happens, you know, something frustrating or angering happens to us, somebody wrongs us or a difficulty at work, or there's some issue that makes us nervous. Do we want to just be like behaviorally pooping our pants every time something difficult happens in life and making a mess of ourselves? Or do we want to be able to handle the situations of life and keep ourselves clean? <laughs> right? yeah. And um, so it just made me think poop happens daily. And um, God wants us to be able to handle it like grownups. But anyway, Edcardo. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with uh, everything uh, you have said. Uh, actually, all of us are in the process of growing up and in the process into perfection. Uh, I just want to uh, quote a verse here uh, supporting the idea that uh, Sister Donna expressed a while back. It's in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. It says, but I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. Uh, this is the commitment of the Apostle Paul. Uh, of course, all of us, uh, when we were still young Christians, we are confused and uh, we do not understand the uh, the purpose of our calling until such time when somebody has discipled us and uh, teach, uh, taught us the things of the of the things about the the purpose of our calling like just what Jesus uh, taught his disciples in in John chapter 15 especially verse 16 <laughs> that all of us were chosen you know chosen to go and uh, bear fruits mm -hmm. and also being uh, a disciple we are being reminded by the Lord Jesus Christ that anyone who serves Jesus uh, will be honored by the Father in John chapter 12 verse 26 so I'm I'm happy that we have verses like this as we are as we are growing old, uh, we have learned how to really focus on the things that God has called us to. And uh, we are focusing now on how to fund the flame inside of us in order to fulfill the calling that we have. Back in Bulacan, uh, all of our elders there are working together to uh, take good care of the ministry that we have there. And here in Mindanao, the work here is very challenging. <laughs> and I'm happy that all of you are praying for the work here. Uh, right now, I'm on my way to the market to buy fish. <laughs> but so happy that uh, uh, I was able to join you today. And so blessed also to hear the comments from everyone. But, you know, I'm so blessed to be reminded of the word commitment because if you are committed, uh, you don't want to, you know, disturb yourself with, with any other things around us. And we have this focus on uh, fulfilling, fulfilling the call that we have received from the Lord Jesus Christ. So right now, the challenge is... Be committed, really. If we are committed, uh, we don't want to uh, allow anything to hinder us from doing the things that uh, we are called to to, uh, to do. So I'm happy about the things I heard from, you know, our sister because of the word commitment, you know. So happy about that and blessed about that because I'm growing old. And I wanna, I wanna grow old and uh, you know, uh, finish everything in accordance with the calling that we have. So I thank God for the opportunity and privilege that we are part of 
uh, his plan and purpose. To him be the glory. Thank you. Thank you, Jackson. Amen. And we're All right, Cargo. Are, are you going to the fishmonger? Yeah, hello, Greg. <laughs> Sorry, I missed the meeting. I, I had to work late, so I'll look forward to seeing the recording. I think it sounds like, John, you you were doing that? Yeah, I, I gave a little introduction for our topic of discussion, the idea that the and we looked we looked at um uh Galatians four um Galatians four Hebrews five yeah Ephesians four Hebrews five right at the end of Hebrews five and the other one was Galatians four nineteen with the idea of um that the the expectation in the scripture is that every Christian matures into Christ, into the fullness of Christ, so that every Christian is walking around like a Jesus, mm -hmm. right? That, that we're all mature in Christ and we have different functions maybe, but we are fulfilling each of those functions as Christ would in, mm -hmm. in full maturity in Christ. And Amen. yeah. And, and so that uh that's our our topic is that and the fact that for the most part at least in the west um we we don't see that we don't see nearly at least every christian maturing in christ mm -hmm. the fullness of christ and we we see a lot of spiritual infants that you know should have as hebrews said you know, developed into maturity and don't. And decade after decade, they're still Christians. Maybe they grow a lot in knowledge. They, mm. they know a lot about the Bible, but they never actually mature in Christ. And mm. they're 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 weak Christians. They're not fulfilling their calling, and they weaken the body of Christ when that happens. And I, and I made sure to to point out that you know largely the blame for that lies at at the feet of the church leadership that mm -hmm. we have a responsibility to make sure that people are actually maturing in christ and mm -hmm. and to diagnose the church when there's a problem when something is not happening because the reality is it all things considered if if you if you're doing a good job of helping people to mature in christ and then you have someone who is not maturing in christ that that should stand out. It shouldn't be the norm. It should stand out and be like, why? What is going on there? Why is this person still here five, 10 years later? They're still needing milk. They're, they're not mature in Christ. They're still walking around like they just, you know, poop their diaper. They just uh, <laughs> a, arrived into the kingdom that they're still pooping their diaper, right? Yeah, it really is like a, you know, a 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 year old still wearing a diaper. And, and, uh, and so, and there's just way too much of that. And, and so I, I'm, I, I've been thinking a lot about this particular thing about mm -hmm. the whole process of, of people in the body of Christ becoming whole and being delivered, healed and mature so that mm -hmm. the body of Christ is actually Christ in the earth. And um and how yeah, they, amen yeah would be just amazing. Up up, right yeah. um and I I'm planning on our um I want to at the next Holy Spirit night I want to cover deliverance in the same context and <laughs> part of the problem I think or the symptoms I mean part of the symptoms that I see is that in most brick and mortar churches that I that I've ever gone to. People don't look like they'll 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 try to think about a, a highlight or a gem that the pastor might say that thing, but they never try to be intimate and in getting to know Jesus Christ in advance. You you know, and I feel like that's a, that's like one. Of, there's 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 other symptoms too. Like over half the pastors in this country look at pornography. Yeah. And and and, and so I I don't. Know, that's uh, that's true a lot of pastors themselves are not mature in christ they may have a lot of knowledge but they themselves are not mature in christ yeah so i might just be spreading to like the congregants because most congregants mm -hmm. people like that i see 
Oh, that, all right, that I grew up with, if I recall. You know, they, they might do some Bible studies every now and then, which is good. And, um, but a lot of times I see people coming in just, or it seems like it, that people are coming in just to be kind of, uh, to experience the cherry pick verses that pastors will sometimes use to make you feel comfortable, you know, and, 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 and being, being open, you know, we all, none of us have total truth. And I think part of the problem is that people don't like, um, uh, being open-minded, you know, they just want to be served total truth on a platter and no pastor has total truth. <laughs> so people just get too comfortable. I think. You know? I, I think I think it's in some cases it's what you're talking about, which is the idea that that you know, you know people are lulled by sort of an easy Christianity. They don't actually get taught what what the requirements are, what, how we're supposed to live. The the high calling of Christ Jesus. You read through the Gospels and you read what Jesus is calling us to. It's a high calling. It's a right. big commitment. It's total, yeah. totally committed. And then I think the other thing is, I've seen this, where I would say those Christians, um, they don't even think about maturity in Christ, right? Yeah. But I've also known a lot of Christians, they would think of themselves as mature in Christ because they have a lot of knowledge yeah. of the Bible, Yeah. right? Yeah. And we should never, ever confuse knowledge of the Bible with maturity in Christ. Those are not the same things, right? Um, Jesus said, "It you know, it's not the hearer, but the doer, right? Yeah. That you, you can know all kinds of things from the scriptures, but if you haven't matured in your own walk and life to fulfill his commandments, yeah. and I, I think we should say this, and then we probably, um, if, unless you're not done, um uh raise has hand yeah raise his hand up um the that we should say this especially for the benefit of the listeners if you're listening on youtube and and you're not a, a, a regular attendee the the idea that when we say maturity in christ what we mean is obedience to the commandments right that we are living out his commandment of love one another as i have loved you that we are are, are or have conquered sin in our lives, that we are um, loving even our enemies, that that we are following God's commandments through Christ in a mature way, that we have practiced that, as Hebrews 5 says, to the point where we have good judgment in Christ, the kind that Christ is calling us to, again, in the gospel. So I think the combination, of things, it, it's, it's sort of two camps, but it's both immaturity. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And I would say probably if you were to take, you know, if we put a percentage on it, it's probably about a 70, 30 percentage split, 70% what you're talking about, 30% what I'm talking about in terms of the, you know, the problem. You know, it's interesting because I, or I, I don't know if I'm going to even hit this on like right at all. So please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but it kind of makes me think how when Paul says that the gospel is a power of salvation for all who believe, let's talk about obedience and not just knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you obey, well, God is probably going to work a lot more in your life than if you just, you know, just, uh, you know. Yeah. Build. If you if you know the commandments and you don't do them, they did you no good. Yeah. 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 Your knowledge did you no, no good. Okay. Go ahead, Ray. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, uh, what John, Peter, Donna, and other people have said have pretty much taken up my list of things. <laughs> the complacency, because <laughs> that's what I do. I write things down so that I don't forget them. Uh, people are afraid, especially of speaking, speaking publicly. And they're afraid of making mistakes. That's what Peter said. I really liked what Donna said about how our passion needs to be fanned. Uh, uh, bad doctrine about people just sitting in the pews thinking, well, I'm here, so and I believe, so I'm saved, and uh, I don't have to do anything else. And then the idea of uh, clearly defining what is meant by maturing in Christ 
And that's just what John just got through talking about. So uh, I, I did have a scripture come to mind, and it's out of Luke 16. It's Luke 16, 16. And I, I do not know if it's applicable or not, um, but I'll read it anyway. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, John the Baptist, came. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. Now, now um, I haven't researched this, but I'm wondering, we're talking about forcing our way into the kingdom of God. Forcing our way. That, that sounds like it takes a lot more effort than simply to sit in a pew and believe or agree with it sounds like we need to have more energy put into it Strong. and um, yes you would agree with that peter yeah struggle tribulation trials i'm thinking of that yeah i say amen to it ray yeah we we, we are forcing our way into the kingdom of God. It takes some effort on our part. It's not, you know, I think about um, Good Friday at Walmart. And they have <laughs> the specials. And you have people at the front doors. And it's practically a riot because people are shoving and kicking and elbowing one another so that they can be the first one to get that big screen TV uh, for their brother-in-law or whatever. And so they're forcing their way into Walmart to, to get the goodies. Well, in a sense, we should be doing the same thing, but we're not kicking people in the shins. Instead, we're loving them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, anyway, that's a good uh, point. Yeah. I like that. But it takes, it takes right. that effort. It takes that effort. So anyway, um, and then the idea of having a, a clear definition of maturing in Christ, uh, something that I really lacked until I came to A2K, and uh, proof that you can know something about the Bible and that that really isn't enough. And um, having the passion to actually do God's will. And sometimes, you know, passion is not something that you feel. It's something that you make a decision about, because really sometimes my apologizing to my family members because I have a bit of a temper, sometimes that's not what I want to do. I don't have a passion about it, but I know it's what needs to be done. And I know I need peace and I peace with them. I love them. And so I have to go and, you know, make amends. Hmm. So, um, you know, anyway, that's that's uh, the other thing, of course, is this doctrine about once saved, always saved, which is really kind of cuts people off at the knees because once they once they think, well, I'm saved, I speak in tongues, I'm saved or I simply I simply believe the Bible. I, I you know, I've made Jesus my Lord and Savior. And then they don't think they really have to do anything else. Man, that's mm -hmm. that really deflates people's motivation to get involved because they think they got their ticket punched already. And uh, I think that's a real problem. So uh, anyway, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Ray, I like your comment that passion doesn't have to be an emotion. It just has to be something that you do. Mm. Yeah, it's really... Yeah, I, I, I remember... Yeah. I remember Zacchaeus, you know, uh, when the first time he heard about the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he tried really his best to see Jesus, to know Jesus. But when he, but uh, there are a lot of people in front of, the, of him, and he was uh, not that tall. He cannot uh, get in to see Jesus. But the passion is there. He mm. has a plan B. He saw a sycamore tree, and he ran before Jesus over there and he climbed the sycamore tree and he did the, you know, an extraordinary thing for a man like him. 
and he received what what uh, he wanted to have. Mm -hmm. The Lord Jesus Christ saw him because of his passion, and the Lord Jesus Christ entered his house. And after that, you know, uh, he he experienced uh, you know an automatic transformation. Uh, he 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 did he didn't believe in the osas thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. After meeting the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, "If I uh, deceive anyone, I, I will I will return what I have taken from them four times." Uh, a transformation took place, and he didn't stop there. He wanted to act, you know. He wanted to do what pleases God in the Lord Jesus Christ. When when he encountered the Lord Jesus Christ in his house, so. Uh, I agree with you, Ray, and that is forcing yourself into the kingdom. <laughs> yes, I just wanted to say something on uh, what Dan shared, because it reminded me of a verse, uh, well, passage in Romans 12, verses 10 uh, and 11. It says, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And it very much like Dan said, makes it sound like something you can choose, not something that needs to be dependent on your emotional state. So amen to that, Dan. <laughs> very good. Um, yes, let's close it out after Inti shared. Sure, yeah. Uh, oh, and Cameron here, hello. Uh, mm -hmm. Hi guys, uh, nice to see you guys. I. Uh, so uh, it had to do with what you said, Ray, about um, passion, and I, I, I think, our, I don't know. I mean, you know, you go to brick and mortar churches, and it's like, you know, there's there's all these statistics on people, you know, caught up in sin and stuff in this country, or at least in the West, and and but but they have a lot of passion, right? And you're talking about like, you know, a lot of people might mistake maturity with passion. And I think that's spot on. Um, like with me, I've been dealing with just the thing that I've been dealing with lately. That's a problem is uh, negative self-talk and I've been working to overcome that. Um, uh, but what I've noticed in my dying to self and living for Christ and for others is that, um, or, you know what I mean? Just under God's rule and loving others um, is that the, I've noticed maturity when it comes to intentionality. Yes. And I had to explain it to somebody recently where, you know, they, they didn't think it was right to pray, uh, you know, to, to pray for, for other people if you just don't feel like it because it may not seem authentic. But Jesus commands us to pray even if someone beats us on the head and tries to kill us. Absolutely. And so I've noticed that once I make my life about my actions I take and also the character I have, it's I it's like it's I'm observing what it's weird I feel like I'm like a, it's like I'm looking with a third person like film camera looking down on my life and I'm seeing the actions I do towards other people and I'm seeing my character that I have with other people and sometimes I fail myself talk but I'm, I'm I'm seeing it more and more and it's not just an in the moment thing like I got I got the spunk because I'm I'm all emotional and I'm really passionate it's it's a, it's an intentionality thing is I'm I'm noticing when I am uh, uh, doing Christ-like activities or things for other people. So I don't know. That's just what's been going on with my life, especially having moved here and living with all these awesome people. So <laughs> anyhow, so, but yeah, that's that's what I've noticed with, with me. Yeah, I like the word intentionality because, you know, we have brains, you know, and God expects us to, yeah, be doers of, the, you know, be a doer. Uh, and you have to intentionally wake up in the morning. You have to intentionally, um, you know, be clued into, you know, where like you are stripping yourself of self. You're dying to self. I get that. I'm I'm very aware of uh, my actions. And uh, like Ray said, I have to go back and apologize and set the record straight. And why do I do that? Because I'm trying to represent Christ to this person, whether they get it or not, whether they know Christ or not. I go back to represent him in a fuller way and apologize and try not to do that again. I am allowing that person to say, I can do better. I am supposed to be more like Christ and less like whatever the heck I was in my past. 
And people get caught up in this. This is why psychology sometimes is a two-edged double sword. Not always good because it favors you to be passive and you can get away with a lot of stuff because, ah, you know, you just weren't raised right, girl. Um, and it wasn't, but here I am. And it's about the lessons that we can learn through the biblical examples. And I think the greatest example of servanthood is our Lord Jesus Christ. I especially know that he didn't feel like going to the cross, but he intentionally <laughs> said that he would do the, the will of God. And he literally died in a physical sense. It was agony for him through that choice. And he had angels given to him by God because God saw his heart to do the will of God. And I think it's the same way with us. You know, Dan talked about God doing stuff in you and for you in the emotional realm, because I tend to be a little bit squirrely sometimes and almost too emotional. And I've got to go back. Uh, but I love the opportunity, whether it's to make amends or to become more perfect. And a lot of people don't believe that. They say, well, you're talking about Christian perfectionism. I'm like, I don't know. There's an awful lot in the Bible that said, be ye holy, even as I God am holy. You know, and so there is some lousy teachings about, well, we're not going for perfectionism. Well, then that means you're telling me that I don't have to clean up my sin. And the Bible speaks to that and says, be holy as I, God, am holy. And just to wrap your little noggin around that, that's climbing up out of self saying, I will to do this transformation with you, God. And that's dying. to say. It's an intentional. It's not a suggestion. <laughs> it's a commandment. And a lot of people. They have melt-toast Christianity. I'm not trying to, you know, um, insult my brothers and sisters, but there's too much sugar, you know, in some of these churches. And I think what it does is it's, it, it appeals to their emotionalism. They're not really being taught the high calling of the walk. John said it beautifully. The high calling is higher than just about you. And I do. I have seen God take care of me in ways uh, when I'm busy doing going about my father God's business, <laughs> you know, when I'm doing that, he takes care of me, you know, and I don't always have to figure it. I've seen it time and again. I'm like, I don't know how you do this, God. It isn't that we never intentionally figure things out, but I do believe I've had the same inkling. Um, when I went to God with this book last night, I cried. I'm like, I get it, God. I hear you. I, I know what you're doing over here. And he, what he's saying is, Time's up, Donna. You know, you've had many, many years. It's you got to grow now. You got to just quit all this crazy. Not that I mean, not just me, but he's he's reminding me. This is what it takes. For me to answer your prayer, you have to know what you're doing. And this is what it takes. Total commitment. And we want to see the power of God. I read a meme the other day and it said, uh, we want to see the power of God. We want to be delivered, but we don't want to die to self. And that is an enormous meme. I wish I could splatter it all over the place because as you're, you know, as you're dying to self, that represents Christ. You're building that Christ in you, like Paul was talking about. Fabulous discussion tonight. Fabulous. Yeah. It goes along with what's going on in my bedroom. I'm like, God, did you tell John what was going on in my bedroom last night? <laughs> well, hey, that's perfect, Donna. So I'm going to tail on that and i'm going to let everybody know if you're out there in youtube land and you want to take part in these enjoyable discussions where we get deep into things then um please do reach out to us at uh a2kchurch.org or you can email us at join us at a2kchurch.org um we'd love to meet you we'd love to get to know you we'd love to talk with you we'd love to share the scriptures together with you pray for you pray with you and um, be brothers and sisters together. So have a great day, afternoon, evening, whenever you're watching this, and um, we will see you next time. God bless you.